Hello, and thank you for the honor of participating in the session. Uh, I'm an endocrine acute care surgeon in Toronto, Canada. I also run a lab focused on AI and surgical performance augmentation. The goal of this talk is to discuss some of the new and exciting applications of artificial intelligence in surgical education. I apologize for not being there in person, but I do hope you enjoy this talk. These are my disclosures. I will not be discussing any other products during this presentation. So just a few words about AI, and I won't dwell too much on the technical details. Uh, AI is loosely defined as the field of computer science and algorithms that strive to replicate cognitive functions such as reasoning, problem solving, decision making, and perception. For example, one of the most exciting applications of AI and machine learning has been in the field of computer vision, where algorithms are designed to recognize patterns in pixelated data in order to achieve human level recognition of objects and structures. And as a result, perform various functions such as tracking objects in videos or making sense of what it sees in images and videos. You may have heard this term often, machine learning. It is not the same thing as AI. ML is a subset of AI and is largely responsible for making AI so popular and impactful in the last decade. ML algorithms provide the means to take large data sets and find subtle patterns, patterns that we can't often see as humans, in order to make new predictions on data that it has then never seen before. And this uh, data can be large databases, it can be words and sentences, or it could be pixels from videos and images like we talked about earlier. There are various forms of ML depending on what you want your algorithm to accomplish. I'm also sure that many of you have heard of the term deep learning and deep neural networks which is another subset of ML, probably the most popular set of AI algorithms. Deep neural networks work just like the nervous system. There's input signals, then multiple intermediate neurons that modulate the signals, and depending on how those signals come together, it results in different outputs. For example, if you have a deep neural network that's able to predict what kind of animal is in a picture, the pixels in the picture are the input signal. And then the hidden layers are able to recognize different shapes. For example, the shape of a beak, texture of the feathers, different color combinations. And based on all these features, it's able to make a prediction. For example, it can say, hey, I've seen this before, this combination of shapes and textures and colors, um, I can tell with 95% probability that this image is a bird. And that's gonna be its output. ML is particularly useful for identifying subtle patterns in large data sets, patterns that may be imperceptible to humans, by using techniques that allow for more indirect and complex nonlinear relationships and multivariate effects compared to conventional statistical analysis. That's all to say it's really a pattern recognition tool. It does not understand the larger context of a problem, just as this cartoon demonstrates so well. And its performance is highly, highly subject to how it was trained, so the source data, how it was curated and fed into the AI model. In other words, garbage in, garbage out. So how can we use this technology for video-based learning and surgical education? In my opinion, you can break it down into two major categories. Assessment, which can be both formative to provide focused feedback for deliberate practice, or summative to make an overall assessment of one's performance. The other category is in performance augmentation, which can be either in the form of intraoperative real-time decision support or coaching and training outside the operating room. Let's talk about assessment for a moment. Like I mentioned, models can be designed to give very focused feedback on a very specific aspect of surgical performance, or they can be designed to predict a more summative evaluation. In the latter, just like many deep neural networks, it can be extremely accurate at making predictions. However, it won't always tell you how it arrived at that conclusion, how it was able to conclude that someone's performance was expert or not like an expert. So the explainability of the model is a major determinant. There are many algorithms now that will identify which instrument is in the field, in what exact position, the path, the force vector, and so on. And there's a vast amount of kinematics data from videos and robotics platform. And all of these are now capable of predicting 
based on whatever pattern of instrument movement, whether a person is a novice or expert. And there are multiple different types of kinematics data that can be utilized to develop AI models in order to predict one's level of expertise. And there are at least one or two dozen papers published on this topic in the literature. This is one example of a really interesting study where the authors used cameras in the OR to capture hand motions while surgeons were doing hand ties or suturing tasks throughout a variety of different surgical cases. They built an AI model that tracked multiple kinematics data from each video segment. And the in end result is a highly accurate model that is able to predict different elements of the OSATS rubric, like fluidity, economy of motion, and tissue handling with very impressive results. But even more impressive is this thing right here, where the AI model demonstrated significantly less variance compared to expert ratings, demonstrating the real value of using AI for summative assessment. The fact that it not only is there to relieve the burden on faculty assessors, but also provides a more objective method that has less bias. And like I said, there are multiple others, uh, other studies out there that have published similar results um, with other models. There are also other studies that look at other factors, such as things like surrogate markers of visual attention, energy expenditure, or stress. In this case, eye tracking was used to classify surgeons as experts versus non-experts. And what about more formative and nuanced assessment for feedback? The authors in this study developed an AI that is capable of providing real-time coaching during simple tasks on VR robotic surgical simulator. Uh, and they demonstrated its ability to improve performance on many levels compared to a control group uh, that underwent self-directed learning instead. While this and other similar AI models are great, they, they not only remain restricted to simulation-based scenarios, but the focus remains on basic technical skills that have limited role for ultimately improving patient outcome. Which brings me to the next set of applications, performance augmentation. Indeed, surgical performance is a highly heterogeneous concept and there are many facets to it. And the most important skills that exemplify surgical expertise is this category right here, advanced cognitive skills. The ability to exercise sound judgment and effective decisions throughout the operation. Can we design algorithms that can recreate the thoughts and the mental model of expert surgeons? Well, the answer is yes, and this is where qualitative research is extremely useful and important. This is an example of a cognitive task analysis of expert surgeons for laparoscopic adrenalectomy, and we mapped out all the different things that experts have to think about in order to do the operation safely and effectively. It is important to identify those key elements, those key decisions and cognitive behaviors throughout an operation, where errors can occur, and develop algorithms that are trained based on experts' mental model. Eventually, this is what we want to build, but in the surgical field. An AI that is capable of tracking high-level cognitive functions, such as what's the best place to dissect, where are the likely locations of critical anatomical structures, or what's the best vector of retraction to get optimal exposure. And this isn't science fiction anymore. We actually use laparoscopic cholecystectomy as a proof of concept. We know that one of the most important cognitive behaviors to minimize the risk of injury is to keep the dissection high up in a safe area along the inferior edge of the gallbladder. We call this the go zone. And to always keep the dissection away from the danger zone where there's a high risk of injury, and we call this the no-go no zone. Can we train an AI to tell us where's the go zone and the no-go zone in videos that it has never seen before? Something very practical, clinically relevant, with significant implications for avoiding bile duct injuries. To do this, we had an expert panel of expert surgeons make freehand drawings on 300 surgical videos describing where the go and the no-go zones were located. This annotated data set was then fed into the deep neural network and trained to make future predictions on videos that it has never seen before. This is what the AI looks like in action. Here the model is making predictions on new videos that it has never seen before or ever trained on. The AI is able to predict where's the go zone in green and where's the no-go zone in red. 
and it does that at an inference rate that is real time. I don't know about everybody else watching this, but when I see this video, the AI is able to reproduce how I see the surgical field. When I operate with residents, the green is where I want them to keep their dissection, and the red is where I do not want them to dissect. So it's easy to see how such a model can be used for intraoperative decision support or to analyze performance or to be used for educational or coaching purposes. We are also now incorporating this AI model online so resident surgeons can upload their videos and get an analysis and compare their dissection in relation to go and no go zones. We are also working with game developers now to incorporate it into mobile apps for residents as a method to deliberately practice their advanced cognitive skills. Surgical decision making, however, is not always a cognitive behavior that relates to a specific location in the surgical field, like where to dissect. Often it occurs at a higher level in relation to the tactical approach of the operation. In this study by my colleague, Dr. Mascagni, he recently published the results on deep CVS, which is a two-stage model that segments hepatocystic anatomy and predicts whether or not each of the three elements of the critical view of safety have been achieved. And here you can see the model in action. It's able to predict the critical view of safety has been achieved and it's ready for clipping and dividing. So where are we going from here? Clearly, there are some very exciting applications of AI in surgical education. In my opinion, these are the main areas that I think will impact us as surgeons in the coming decades. We talked about assessment. It's not a question of if, but a question of when performance assessment, board certification, maintenance of certification, will all at the very least be augmented using computer vision and AI. And we've already seen a few proof of concepts published. We also talked about coaching and performance augmentation. This idea of incorporating the thoughts and processes and the mental model of not just one expert, but a panel of experts from around the world into these surgical AI algorithms and then disseminating it around the world for both intraoperative decision support so when you operate, it's like you're operating with a group of mentors watching over your shoulder and guiding you. And two, video-based coaching. We know coaching is great, but there are many logistical barriers. So an AI-powered coaching tool like Go no -Go Net or DeepCVS will become increasingly prevalent. Ultimately, we need data and heterogeneous large breadth of data to design models that are generalizable to different scenarios and settings. Many of us are working towards creating a centralized repository of surgical data, including videos, in order to achieve these objectives. Thank you again for your time and the opportunity. I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. For those of you interested in collaborating, I have provided my contact information. Thank you.